there, I'm Emily Russell with Clearview Regional Medical Center and today we are pleased to bring you a wonderful program. One of our new certified nurse practitioners, Miss Sandy Hawk, is doing a really great presentation on the advantages of different vitamins and minerals that we need as we age. Um, Sandy is our new practitioner and provider at our Social Circle Clinic, which is located at 1027 Bateman Drive, Suite C in Social Circle. Um, if you'd like to make an appointment, give us a call at 770 2 Six, seven, eight, four, six, two. And without further ado, we're going to go ahead and hear what Sandy has to say. So who needs to take supplements? Dallas? Everyone <laughs> in today's world. Um, there, do, there are some things that you need to take into consideration, and that's the things that we talked about. Your past medical history, high blood pressure, um, diabetes, Kidney failure is a big thing because you, you don't clear some of the supplements that, that go through your kidney. Um, are you a fa fairly healthy eater? You know, it used to be that we talked to everybody about a, getting a well-rounded multivitamin, right? And we've kind of steered, you know, I'm sure you guys have been around long enough to know that things get really popular and then we move, you know, bell-bottom pants and then we go away from that and we come back. And it's the same way with vitamin therapy and supplementation. We used to say, well, it's a good idea to take a good multivitamin. Now, what we're saying is, take what you're deficient in. Make sure that you've gone about you know, getting some lab work. Getting, take what you know that you're deficient in or addressing certain issues, whether it's fatigue or you know, you're trying to deal with some things that we'll talk about in a few minutes, heart health or those kind of things. So make sure that, that you're addressing or if you're under a lot of stress, are you out of the sun because we're going to talk about vitamin D deficiency and the medication. So it can't be a blanket answer, yes or no, do you need to take supplements. It's really going to depend on your body. Are supplements regulated? I get this question all the time. And the reality is, are they regulated? Yes. Are they regulated like your medications? For those of you that are taking medications every day, no. Um, but there are three regulatory bodies um, that regulate supplementation, and that's the FDA that you've got a handout on. Um, it's under the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. And then the Federal Trade Commission does regulate labeling to make sure that it matches. However, most of this is done when a new ingredient comes out that's in your supplement or um, as a new company comes about, they make sure that, that it, their labeling matches what the products are. But the, the testing is definitely not as rigorous. They don't have to go through the same standards that your medication has to go through. However, disclaimer here again, how many medications have you heard about that went through great testing and then we found out six months later it killed somebody? So even though we do great testing, we have to remember that it's a, it's a similar situation. And then, of course, this is me down at the bottom because I'm a supplement taker. Would you, you would never guess how many vitamins I can swallow all at one time. <laughs> and what about the recommended daily allowance? Because people talk a lot about that when they're good, like Ms. Pissarro talked about with doing food labels. Dallas? Well, what came about for me when I heard this when we were in a class is that these were set in 1940. Whoa. Oh, wow. 1940. And it was based on a 150 pound man who was inactive. So all these labels tell us DMV, daily minimum value. That means what we need just to survive. But none of us are just surviving anymore. I mean, we all want to be active, we want to be doing things. So as we get older, the other issue is that our body becomes less absorbent. So that means we need to take in more of those same vitamins in order to keep more. Does that make sense? So, so if our absorption goes down, then we have to put in more vitamins in our body just to get the same amount of vitamins we got when we were in our 30s. So that's another thing that most people don't understand. But yet, once you realize that that's just to survive, then you begin to understand that as we get older, we have some things that we need more of. So 60 to 80% of people get less than 80% of the needed nutrients. So I put a sick person over here because that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to keep you as healthy as possible. Um, Dallas has a great saying, and that is, age has no expiration date. And as we get older, we start thinking about a lot of these things. What do we want our retirement to look like? like? And we want our retirement to be that we're still feeling like doing things and going and traveling and doing the things that you'd like to do when you're no longer working that nine to five job. 
but if you're not healthy enough to do so, then that's where the challenges arise. So we want to make sure that we do the supplementation um, that your body may need just to keep you healthy. So the first thing that I like to talk about is joint health because frequently, actually, the statistics are about 80% of folks over the age of 50, so that includes me, have some kind of joint pain. And a lot of times we're talking about joint health. And I'm gonna tell you, my mom is 91 and um, she's had both hips replaced and I'll remember going to see one of the orthopedic surgeons in Athens when I worked at St. Mary's. And I said, okay, she's now in her late 80s, we don't want to go through another hip replacement, but now our hips are bothering her again. What can we do? And so I expected this great medication that he was going to write out on a prescription pad. And he said, there's three things that you can do at this point. Anti-inflammatories, and you guys may have seen all the stuff that's coming out about them as well, mm -hmm. causing heart attacks and strokes. So anti-inflammatories, glucosamine chondroitin, and omega-3 fatty acids. Okay. So those were the suggestions just to help with joint health versus you know this great surgical procedure that would be because the bottom line is at her this point in life doing you know, other surgery is not the best option for her. Um, go ahead. Well, I think too it's important because I, I, I mean I'm helping her right now. If you think about your muscles, you know we were talking about protein earlier. The muscles on your body are like the suspension on your car. We don't think about it that way, but when our suspension gets weak then that puts more pressure on the body and that's when the pain begins to come. So there are exercises we can do every day and I have her doing them now at 91 and in two weeks, there's a significant difference in her balance, her walking, she can walk without a cane now. So I just remind everybody that it doesn't matter, you know, what, what Sandy said earlier is good health has no expiration date. So you, you don't need to stop exercising to, to keep those muscles strong because that's one of the biggest things you can do to keep that stress off those joints. And so the first one I want to talk about is vitamin D because I can tell you as a practitioner and because I've been around in healthcare for 30 years, we didn't talk a lot about vitamin D deficiency before. Um, and so people say, well, what, you know, nobody talked about vitamin D deficiency before. Why are we talking about it now? Well, we did a great job of, of making everybody very aware of skin cancer. And you got to get sunscreen on and we don't want you to have that melanoma. We've done such a good job and we've got such high potency sunscreen now that people are getting the vitamin D from the sun and we quit doing what mama told us to do and drink our milk or milk products so we've lost the vitamin D that we got from some of the milk fortified uh, with vitamin D foods so a lot of times people will come in to me complaining of joint pain or muscle aches and we'll do a vitamin D level and they're critically low and so we have to supplement with that so the amount of replacement depends on the severity of the deficiency and so how does it work? Um, dang, that's good. I didn't realize I had my son blaring and moving. I'm getting better despite the fact that I don't know that I'm very good at technology. So this is just a slide kind of showing you because you hear these terms, vitamin D3, so how it works in converting and working with the parathyroid gland for good bone health. And by the way, vitamin D is one of the changes in the last, since 1940 that the FDA did change on your daily minimum values. It's the one they have said Hey, as you get older, you need more of this because they're beginning to recognize it. And because the supplement, just like everything else that we talk about, the lab ranges depend on your provider. Everybody's lab has a little bit different normal range for vitamin D. So there's no consensus on the optimal level of vitamin D intake to reduce the parathyroid hormone. And that's why many laboratories report that the normal range is so wide, 20 to 40, some say 50 to 100. Weight loss experts like that value to be close to 60. So we don't start really talking about supplement until you're 20 or lower on your vitamin D level. So how much do I take? Um, even for uh, pediatric and adolescent folks, we start talking about supplementing with 400 to 800 international units per day. If you're not going by lab, if you're not, if you haven't had your practitioner order a vitamin D level, a thousand international units is kind of a catch-all good dosage to be on. Uh, unless you say, you know what, Sandy, I drink vitamin D fortified milk every day. I can tell you that I have people that look like Emily, brown as a gingerbread cake, that end up with low vitamin D levels. So it doesn't really matter that you see that she's been in the sun and got that nice suntan. She still could have a low vitamin D level. So. For true vitamin D deficiency, we do replace with 1,500 to 2,000 international units per day. 
And oftentimes when you're low, you'll hear of people getting a 50,000 unit booster dosage that they take once a week for eight weeks wow. um, just to get their levels up. And then we tell people to take a thousand after that. How much is too much? Good question. I was just about to spit out that vitamin D is one of those vitamins that is a fat soluble vitamin. So vitamins A, D, E, and K, we don't get rid of like our water soluble vitamins. So that's why you really, if you're boosting with more than that minimum supplementation of the 1,000, you would want to go by a lab value. If I, was, if, I had, if I had replaced yours because it was critically low, in six months I'd recheck a value to see, okay, now I've had him do 1,000 a day after that big mega dosage. But 1,000 a day for most folks that are not drinking them is a perfect dose to not, to not be too much. My hip won't hurt. Right. right, exactly. That won't hurt. That's exactly right. Because really, that's that's just a great point. My my point in being here and talking to you about supplements is that we as healthcare providers want to do no harm, right? We don't want you taking things that you that could be harmful to you. Good practical example of that is that I was training a lady. She was in her early 60s, and every day she complained of pain in her arm. And we had talked about it. She had a scar here. She had broken her arm about two years prior. Had plates and screws in there. But every day she said it hurts. Well, I knew after a while that wasn't normal. So I asked her, I said, have you had your vitamin D levels checked in a long time? She goes, well, what does that got to do with anything? So she goes to the doctor and sure enough, she's like half of what she should have. Well, it turns out that that bone had never healed. Oh, after wow. the surgery, it had never healed because her vitamin D levels were low and the calcium had never built back up. They had to go back in, re-break it, redo it. Oh, and now a year and a half later, she's fine. She has no pain. Oh, wow. And so that brings us to the point that dosages do sometimes have to be adjusted for people that are overweight, people that don't absorb well, people that have a drug-induced vitamin D deficiency that they're on certain medications. Next thing is calcium. So you're nice, and, and I have to give Dallas complete credit. I do not cook in our household. He is the cook. I would never put chia seeds down here as a source of, vitamin, of calcium, but my husband puts chia seeds and everything. So that's why you see milk, you see cheese, you see yogurt, you see chia seeds. So if those of you who put chia seeds, you know you're getting some calcium. So I, I can honestly tell you didn't know that until Dallas. Little or no calories, and uh, they, they will hold nine times their weight in water. So summertime is a problem for us, dehydration, right? Well, they'll help you stay hydrated throughout the summer. There you go. Y'all didn't pay any extra for that. 60% <laughs> of adults do not get enough calcium. Again, we, we quit doing what mom told us. We don't get the milk in. We often don't get the calcium fortified things. A lot of people thought, and, and, and you know, I know even when I was pregnant 20 some odd years ago, they would say, take some Tums. That'll help you get some calcium. Uh-oh. Tums only gives you about, they only absorb about 5% of the calcium. So it's not a good calcium supplement. Um, if that's what you're taking it for. Is, this, is citrate better? Yes, it is. Um, and why are some people deficient? A lot of times they're on weight loss programs, they're on vegetarian diets, they're, they're not getting the calcium in for some, those reasons. And how do I much do I supplement? Typically a good rule of thumb is about 1,200 milligrams, unless, again, you're doing it because you have known osteoporosis, somebody's going based on your medical history. Remember, these are just blanket, general dosages for the average person um, but you would divide that dosage into three or four times a day and so this kind of just gives you ages 19 to 50 about a thousand milligrams a day over the age of 51 1200 milligrams a day and, and I have to be honest with you I was I'm great I'm a great supplement person I always would forget that I maybe needed to supplement with calcium but when you start thinking females especially osteoporosis prevention you need to boost, to boost with that extra calcium mm -hmm. and I have one more question. yes sir <clears throat> do you have any data on the relationship between uh, serum calcium and the deposition of, in plaque uh, arterial plaque? plaques you know I do know there is some research out there and my cardiology friends have shared with me as we talk <clears throat> about some supplement now they have always reassured me that when I tell people to just get their minimum standards in, that we don't have to worry that that's going to be something that dip, that builds up in calcium plaque within your vessels. Is that what you're addressing? Um, but as far as the background of that research, you know, I can't tell you that I know a whole lot about that. Dallas, have you? 
you know, other than your calcium score, I was right. reading on that the other day. That it's very important to have your calcium score checked. That you could, your cholesterol can be great, but if your calcium score is up there around one, I believe is what it was, then and that is to measure the blockages for those of you that may you can you can do a calcium score to see if there's any calcified and calcium based deposits in your heart by doing that exam. But supplemental calcium should not increase your likelihood of developing that. A lot of the problem in the South is calcium in the water. That's why we have so many kidney stones, too. Yeah. It's because there's a lot of calcium in our water down here. Um, the next area of the body that I want to tell you about that I address because I spent so many years of my career in cardiology is cardiovascular health. And coenzyme Q10 is something that people talk a lot about. There's a hospitalist here at Clearview um, that puts almost every patient um, that, that gets admitted here on coenzyme Q10. And why does he do that? He does that because coenzyme Q10 makes energy in every cell of the body. So if you're stressed, if your body's stressed because you're sick, then you're not, your coenzyme Q10 levels will automatically decrease. But something that I dealt with in the cardiology world would be people that would say the cholesterol medicine is making me have muscle aches. The cholesterol medicine is making my memory not so good. And so what we would tell them is to supplement with coenzyme Q10 because those cholesterol medicines do stop the production of cholesterol. That's why you need them. And I, I get people all the time that, that say, you know, I don't believe in those statins. And that's because you weren't in the room with the lady or gentleman who had a heart attack. I was. And if I can give you a statin that can prevent the likelihood of that plaque buildup, it's a risk versus benefit thing. And if I can tell you that this supplement will help you with some of those muscle aches, then I want you to swallow it. Because I can tell you, of all the things that you get kind of a definable difference in the quality of your day, you may not feel any better if I tell you to take calcium. You just know you did the right thing. But with coenzyme Q10, you literally can feel a difference because you don't have those muscle aches. So something right. really important for you to do. Oh. Yeah, yes, ma'am. How does this affect if you uh, have pacemaker? Not anything at all. It, remember the, um, now, both coenzyme Q10 and omega-3 fatty acids do help with your heart rhythm, some too, but I always joke because, again, I worked with cardiology for so long, that's the electrician's problem versus the plumber problem, and we're talking about the plumbing problem with black blockages, and you're talking about the electrical problem with the pacemaker. No issue at all. But we do encourage 100 milligrams a day of coenzyme Q10 if you're doing it just because I told you it might be beneficial. 200 milligrams if you're doing it because you're on a statin and, and trying to, or some cardiac health uh, issues. Fish oil, you guys have seen a lot about fish oil. It's everywhere. And it's funny to me because um, we didn't talk about fish oil before and now we talk about it a lot. And, and it's because it, it can help. I just told you doc, one of the docs, the orthopedic doc said fish oil can help your joints. Well, this slide tells you fish oil can help lots of things. Um, I, I joke with Dallas sometimes that kitty cats follow him around Monroe because he takes so many fish oil tablets. <laughs> and why? <laughs> because it helps. It helps keep the cell membranes elastic. It does cover the nerves. Uh, helps regulate cholesterol and triglyceride levels. That tends to be why Sandy Hawk would tell you to do it. But there's also a great benefit when you're looking at um, preventing memory loss, dementia, depression. Um, mood, immunity, you name it, I, I think we've got it all here. And yet we went away from when we grew up where everybody had a teaspoonful of cod liver oil every day. Oh. And they said you didn't need any vitamins or anything, that's all you needed. <laughs> and then they did away with it. Isn't that funny? Yeah, my dad would tell you that's what, he, what, what his mom did to him all the time. And you're exactly right. And now, and, and that's one of the things I want to tell you about, the warning that you need to, to know about fish oil. A, you have to be careful, as with every supplement, that you go with some a company that is reputable, either someone that your physician, your nurse practitioner, your physician's assistant, your pharmacist has said, hey, this is a reputable company, um, because you don't want fish oil with mercury in it. You want to be careful about the mercury content of fish oil, but you really don't have to worry about dosages from fish oil. You almost can't take too much. Now, don't let that be an excuse to, to overdose, because 
we as Americans think one is good and 12 is better, and that's not always <laughs> true. Um, but most forms that we address with the omega-3s are the DHA and EPA. There are multiple other forms of fish oil or omega-3 fatty acids. So the natural food sources you see here, fish, walnuts, broccoli, edamame beans, um, and then a lot of people talk about flaxseed oil um, as a way to supplement omega-3s. Unfortunately, only about 10% of the flaxseed oil is converted over to the omega-3s. One of the things that interested me was we were doing a lot of, we do a lot of bike riding and things like that, but 20% of your energy comes from those fatty acids that are in that fish oil. So that means that if you're deficient in that towards the end of the day, even though you're not out doing these long runs or rides or anything, you're going to get a little tired. Your, your energy is going to drop about 20% if you don't have that. Sandy, you just said something about broccoli. There was something on television the other day where they were saying that raw broccoli is no good for you. They should only be cooked. You know anything about that? I haven't heard that. Have you heard anything about not eating raw broccoli? Not unless there's a bacteria that's on it. That's yeah, I was going to say, I would wonder either chemical sprays. They, they didn't say that. They said that the uh, it's not cracked up to what it could be in ways of preventing health problems. <coughs> if you eat it raw, if you eat it cooked, it is beneficial. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that because, of course, what I always encourage people to do as much as possible is to eat food in the rawest form possible because mm -hmm. we need it for roughage, and we're going to talk about fiber in a minute. We need that roughage, and so most of the time, so I'll have to look at that. I haven't heard anything about that. You'll be, I, I you'll be looking at that when we get home. Yeah. <laughs> there is another. You do have to be, away, be wary of the advertisements because there's lots of stuff that says includes omega-3 fatty acids. Frequently that's got another form, the ALA form, the alpha linolytic acid, that doesn't convert as well. You just don't get as much bang for your buck. And that's, we don't want that. So average dosage, a thousand milligrams a day. That's typically what I put people on in the beginning when I'm trying to address people that have come to me and said, I can't take my statin. At least I can know that I'm helping cholesterol and triglycerides some with omega-3 fatty acids. All right, now that you've eaten your meal, we're gonna talk about digestion. Because this is an area that when we talk about folks that get older, we know that your digestive enzymes decrease as you get older, so you don't digest things as well. Your levels of probiotics go down as you get older. And so digestive health is really, really important to all of us, but really gets much more important as you age. So, Research shows there's an average of 10 pounds of bacteria in the intestinal flora. So there's more bacteria in and on the body than there are cells in the body. So we think that's a, a disastrous thing, right? You're thinking that has to do with disease, but it's actually how our body is supposed to function. We have bacteria in our nose. We have bacteria in our gut. And honestly, what we found is that we put people on antibiotics forever, right? Those antibiotics don't just kill the good bacteria, the bad bacteria, they kill the good bacteria as well. And what you find, and that's why, ladies, when we talk about you getting yeast infections and when you take antibiotics, is because you've not the normal floor of your body and that yeast overgrows. So what you find in the hospital setting now is if we prescribe you an antibiotic, especially IV antibiotics, you get a probiotic that goes along with it to try to balance that out. Anybody gardener in here? This is the way I always describe it. You know, when the weeds come up, they take the nutrients away from the plants. Well, that somewhere around 40, the bad bacteria in our gut begin to take over, and they rule out the good bacteria. So that's why we have to put those back in, because it's like weeds in the garden. And if we don't pull them, they're going to take over. They do. So probiotics. You see my nice little gentleman on the commode over here. He's <laughs> talking about digestion. Um, but he's, We've, this is really about absorbing in your gut well. It, it, it definitely affects weight loss because you'll have oftentimes people that are really working trying to lose weight, they can't do that effectively. Getting a probiotic that helps them absorb the nutrients in the food that they eat and in supplements makes a big difference. Your immune system and of course elimination. What about yogurt? Jamie Lee Curtis looks really good, doesn't she, on that Activia commercial? She really looks good, and she talks about you needing probiotics. Unfortunately, the yogurt is good for you, and you will hear me tell you, especially the new Greek yogurt that has some extra protein in it, um, is a great thing to do health-wise, 
most of the omega-3s are already, I mean, omega, most of the good probiotics are already dead by the time you take them in because of the processing and the amount of time they've sat. So uh, it's a great advertisement. You just don't get quite as much as you need when you take that yogurt in. Um, so every time you should take a probiotic, every time you take an antibiotic, and you, make, you need to make sure you have probiotics a minimum of three to um, five times a week. Um, there are good probiotics, um, even from a pharmacy standpoint, Flora Store is something that you can buy, Walmart stocks it. There are multiple probiotics out there. Um, you just need to, again, make sure that you're getting it from a reputable company. Somebody that's um, not filling it full of one probiotic should have multiple probiotics in there. So again, a balance of several. Fiber, and I'm not getting paid by Benefiber. Fiber. Just having to be excused for the part. So fiber, fiber does help you stay regular, but it does so much more for you. Um, you need both soluble and insoluble fiber that can work to lower cholesterol. It does help you stay full when you eat. Helps your blood sugar stay stable. Um, makes you lose weight. Helps you live longer. Um, and so when you think about the soluble versus insoluble fibers, the soluble, the good way for me to remember it, because I have to keep it simple for me, the good way to remember that soluble is anything that gets mushy, like um, apples, you add water to apples, you get applesauce. Oatmeal is mushy, so those are just some examples. Um, insoluble fiber is the roughage, the peel. Um, so, I'm, uh, Having had cancer twice, we were talking about this earlier, one of the things that, that hit me about this is that the best way to prevent colon cancer is 10 grams of insoluble fiber a day. Okay, you can take that in the form of a pack, whatever. I mean, I, I have it in a pack, but they don't share that with us. But the number one way for us to prevent colon cancer is 10 grams of insoluble fiber a day. So, and now, Mr. Sorry, we'll have to look at whether I'm advising broccoli and I need to check on that because that's <laughs> part of the insoluble. Um, and then our brain. What kind of supplements can we do to just have a better brain health? We've talked about a couple already. Omega-3 fatty acids, good for dementia, um, good for um, memory, helping with memory, um, multiple sclerosis. They encourage uh, omega-3 fatty acids. So we've already talked about some of those, but there are some that can, again, help your mental and physical health. And that's your water-soluble vitamins. So you talked earlier about what vitamins do I have to be careful of and taking too much of, and those would be the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K. Um, did I miss anything? The water-soluble vitamins are the ones you don't have to worry so much about because if you take too much, you're just gonna have nice, expensive urine. You just get rid of what your body doesn't need. So, um, several of the vitamin B complex vitamins are neurotransmitters. That just means you're gonna kinda of get the cobwebs out of your brain and get you mentally focused and on track. And I don't know about you guys, but about two hours from now is when my brain needs a pick-me-up because I'm getting a little foggy and I'd like to take a nap and my patients don't really think that's a good idea. So um, that's what the vitamin B6 can help for you. It does uh, help for normal brain development and function, helps the body with the normal hormones, serotonin, norepinephrine. Anybody know what serotonin might help work for you as what, what it might do for you. There you go. So it helps you sleep. So you see my little sleepy person down and it helps mood. Melatonin is another one. In fact, if I can tell you of a nice natural sleep aid that I find works really well, that's melatonin. Um, there's so many side effects from my great prescription drugs that I can give you, Ambien, Lunesta, Ambien can make you feel a little crazy and do some nutty things and we don't like giving those addictive medicines. Um, but melatonin is something that they do with children. So it's very it's a very safe supplement for you to use. Start out with two milligrams, you can go up to four on melatonin. So back to B6. Um, remember it's a water soluble vitamin, so for a deficiency and you can draw B, B, uh, vitamin B levels, B12 levels. Um, but this is the dosage range, 2.5 to 25 milligrams for three weeks, and then you can take 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams per day as a maintenance treatment. Again, you get rid of what your body doesn't need. B12, everybody comes to me and thinks that if they got a B12 shot, all in life would be well. They would have more energy, they would lose weight. 
it, it, it can be a benefit, but most of the time we really get, because of our diet, because we tend to be such great meat-eating society with beef, that we typically get enough B12 in our diet um, with eating cheese, milk, um, meat. Um, but it is important. It does help with getting the red blood cells ready to carry the oxygen to uh, the cells in your body. So the Dietary Guidelines for Americans and the Institute of Medicine, so over the age of 50, you need 2.4 micrograms per day of B12. You do tend to have less gastric enzymes break down that B12, and people sometimes have an anemia called pernicious anemia where they literally can never absorb B12, and they also always have to have it in an injectable form. Um, so that's, that's someone that never can digest and, and break down um, vitamin B12. So there's the um, dosage recommendations. So I've given you lots of information. I've got your brain going, I know. <laughs> but I do want you to take away a couple of things before I open it up for any more questions. And that is, there is no absolute in any, th any of the guidelines that I've given you. They really depend on your body. So I encourage you, if I've given you some information today and you think, well, you know, I might need to do more calcium, make sure you talk to your provider that you get some guidance from them. And of course, I'm in social circle. If you don't have a provider, come see me. Um, but I do want to tell you that this is a booming, it is a multi-million dollar industry now because people are realizing and people are desiring to be healthy longer. And they're finding that supplements, is just that's just another piece of the stool. When you're looking at that stool to stay healthy, we need to know you need to eat right. We know you need to get enough sleep. We want you to watch your stress level and supplements is just that other leg of the stool to get your body balanced. If we don't have one of those legs, this chair is going to fall over and we want to keep you from falling over, right? We want to keep you nice and healthy. Anything else, Dallas? I think when you talk about eating healthy too, I always try, I, I like to talk about this because we can go to the grocery store and put all the right things in the basket and we're still not eating what we need to eat because for instance, if you do some homework, about 75% of all the produce you buy in the big stores comes out of three valleys in the United States. So they have to pick that. When it comes from California, they have to pick it early before it ripens. Well, anybody that knows anything about plants, the plant ripens on the vine. That's when all the nutrients go in it. So if you pick it prior to that, you've cut out most of the nutrients in that plant. So it's not that we're not doing things right, necessarily. It's that because of the way we process food now over the last 100 years, it's changed what's in it. And I always tell people this, you know, when you go to the grocery store, the frozen section, well, when I was growing up, that wasn't as healthy as the fresh. Well, today that's reversed. The, f the frozen vegetables are healthier than the fresh vegetables, unless those fresh vegetables are grown somewhere in this area and they're allowed to ripen and then picked and brought here. The reason for that is when they freeze those vegetables, they wait and let them ripen in the ground they cut them, they take them in, and they freeze them. And so all the nutrients are in them. When they cut what they consider fresh, say a tomato in, in California, okay, that tomato's green. And her dad raised tomatoes, and believe me, green tomatoes are made for one thing. You can fry them and eat them, but other than that, they're just not good. <laughs> so they bring that tomato, they spray it with a certain acid over there to keep it, so when they transport it, and then they spray it with another acid when they get here, so it'll turn red for us, so we'll think it's ripe. Ooh. That's sad, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But but it's the truth. So when you buy your vegetables, IQF is what it's called. It's called you know independent or individually quick frozen is what that stands for. You'll get far more nutrients out of that than you will out of a fresh vegetable unless you go up here to Whipple Wheel or some of the farms around here and buy your produce. How about how about canned vegetables? Cans That's are good, good, but the problem there is sodium. There's so much sodium in all the canned stuff now that you can eat that and tomorrow I have a scale that registers your body water and I can tell you I can put people on a certain diet today and tomorrow they'll have three pounds more water than they did today. Four or five sometimes because of the sodium. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So it really if you get to if you get to pick and some people can't. I mean some people are their diet is limited by because of their living situation that they have to do canned. But if you get to pick you do want to steer clear of the canned vegetables. They're not nearly as healthy as fresh or frozen. That's great. And when it comes to fish, I get this question all the time too. People love this tilapia, and, and it's okay, 
but it has absolutely no nutritional value hardly at all. It's good protein, but when it comes to all this other stuff, it's not that, I, I mean, I won't go into details of how they raise them or why they were, any of that stuff, but are you going to eat fish, salmon, a cold water fish is much healthier than a warm water fish. How about that? So any fish is like trout, it's very healthy. Anything grown in cold water is much healthier than warm. You can still eat tilapia. <laughs> Look, I know you've heard it. What you need to do is halt that and deed right now. You won't catch me in that. You won't catch me in Captain D's. Unless they have salmon. They have salmon, and I'll eat their salmon. I don't remember that point. But you see, you think, my point is, you think you're eating healthy. You think you're doing things right. And you're not, you know, and we're not, and nobody's telling us this. And so it just kind of, I don't know, it, it gets on my nerves that we are all trying to do and, and work so hard to do this, and, and yet we're not getting the right information to allow us to make the good choices. Wow. Now I have a question. Mm -hmm. Have you got a tune-up machine at your office that you can pick up a sample and say, you need more this, 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 and here's how much you need? You mean as far as supplements are concerned? Mm -hmm. We do a vitamin D level, we do a B12 level for really just general, and then your your chemistry show you how well your calcium levels are doing. So, and that's standard of any provider you do. What typically does those, um, and we didn't used to do vitamin D levels, but now almost anyone that throws in, I'm tired, I'm worn out, we add, we add a vitamin D level to that. But yes sir, we have a lab in our practice, and you know, all the lab, Core Quest, all of them run the same standard labs. Now, you don't tend to, a lot of this, uh, there are some, there's a, a real specialized lab that, that also um, tells you how much omega-3 fatty acids you're deficient in. Unfortunately, my cardiology buddies inform me that those are a class three recommendation by the American College of Cardiology, which means class three recommendations means it could do harm. So there's the, just, you know, you think you're doing the right things, just like Dallas said. You think that maybe based on some of these high-tech recommendations, we put you on a cholesterol medicine and maybe you didn't need one. You Maybe you didn't need one. So sometimes you just have to... But, but I had that done, and, you know, she laughed earlier about the cats following me. But I take eight, sometimes 8,000 milligrams of fish oil a day, and mine was right. low. So there you go, absorption. So what we talked about today. So... There is no, unfortunate, no catch-all. You just have to kind of analyze where are you dietary-wise, what do you think, based on the things we've talked about today. You know, I tell people all the time, I don't tell them, I don't give them the, the I don't make them feel guilty about the tilapia like Dallas just did, but, but I tell them I want fish three times a week, and then I, I go right ahead and do the disclaimer. I don't like fish. I'd rather swallow a supplement of omega-3 fatty acids. I'd rather do it. And I do tell you that a lot of people will complain about burping fish oil. Remember that a lot of that is how good of a fish oil you've bought. If it doesn't digest well, you're refluxing it back up and you burp and taste the fish oil. Sometimes that's because it's just not a good quality. Yes, ma'am. Anything particular that gets the lung help? You know, the omega-3 fatty acids do have, do help a little bit with cell elasticity. You know, Dallas, do you anything that you're thinking of supplement-wise? Not as far as rebuilding the lung. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the one you were referring to about help, helping the oxygen? That's B12. Arginine. B12, arginine is a supplement that opens up your blood vessels that does help. So arginine is a supplement that some people use in the cardiology world. But that would be something you kind of want to talk to with your pulmonologist and say, hey, somebody mentioned arginine, would it help? Now, is the arginine something that's in the fish oil? No, arginine is a separate supplement. Actually, bodybuilders do it to build up some muscle that opens up blood vessels and gives you more blood flow to the muscle, but it could be some benefit. I used to, I would get these sores in my mouth and I would drink buttermilk and it would help. And then somebody told me that they didn't have that, the, the probiotic stuff in buttermilk anymore. But it, I don't know. Keepers now what we encourage people to drink to try to get those probiotics. So, I, I have, you know, I'm not sure I know I like buttermilk, but when I get those, I would drink it and it would help, but, but now it doesn't. But probiotics would help you maybe in a ta tablet. Yeah, so I'm taking this probably that you're. Buttermilk biscuits growing up? Yeah, I'm taking it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, soluble and insoluble fiber. 
Right, roughage, more your broccoli, yes, apples, the peelings, the broccoli. Sweet potato and versus the peeling of the sweet potato. Oh, oh it, it, so you want to eat both. Uh, yeah, the peeling is the, the insoluble. Yes, sir. Right, and that fiber is going to do so many, because we always think fiber just for digestion, but it's so much more than that. It really does help with all different parts of your body, so it's important to get both of those. Um, types of fiber in your diet. So the ins the soluble, also things like blueberries, that's <coughs> another good example. Um, but again, that's where my brain has to go. It has to be something I can add water to to make it mushy in. So that's where the, so the cereal will be the mushy Yeah. Yes, sir. That's right. Yeah. And now they have, you know, fiber one cereal and things that where you don't have to question whether you're getting fiber or not. They, they have it on the label. Anything else? Can it, can it significantly reduce the amount of sodium ingested from canned vegetables by rinsing the vegetables before cooking? Yes, sir. Yes, you can sure reduce can. it significantly. I think that's your question. Yes. Yeah. Wash it off. Perfect suggestion for those that have to do canned. Yeah. That is a great thought because we used to tell people in the cardiac world where we were really harping at them about you cannot add sodium to your food and they would not really think about the, the, the salt in the canned food, we would encourage them to, to rinse it. That's a great thing to add. The worst source than vegetables is soup, canned soup. You're exactly right. Yes. That's exactly right. And, and I know you have to really look at labels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was that probiotic combo you mentioned a while ago? Flora store that the many companies have them, but one of the ones that you actually can use from Walmart that I'm familiar with is called Flora Store. Still that. <laughs> <laughs> so that I can make sure it's F L O R A S T O R. I okay, think, okay. but I can I can okay, hit my apocryphes so that I can make sure I spell it right. And that's just one. There are multiple ones out there that are that are good, um, but that's just one that kind of the medical world can use. There's a prescription probiotic, but you don't really necessarily, you don't need a prescription for it, but there are prescription versions of probiotics too. I have a good story to end that helps me remember things like salt. You know, Harry Truman, when he would choose his uh, cabinet, he would just put you through all these interviews, and then it came down to the last interview was with him, and you had to go have dinner. <coughs> so he decided whether you were gonna be in his cabinet or not, he would watch you when your food came to the table. If you salted or peppered your food before you tasted it, you were not in his cabinet because you didn't have all the information you needed to make that decision. <laughs> and so that was how he decided whether you became part of his cabinet. Or not. I tell that story because it makes you think about what you're doing and what you're putting in your body. Yes, sir. I heard that same story by J.C. Penney before he would hire anybody for a significant job. He may have known Harry Truman. Yeah. <laughs> That's why Truman didn't like MacArthur because MacArthur used a lot of salt. There you go. Who knows? Well, thank you guys for your time. Y'all been a great audience. Love the questions, and I really appreciate y'all kind of jumping in here. You make things a lot more fun, and you advanced my slides before I could get there. Um, last meeting, I could have sworn this was going to be totally different from what it had been. Is that a compliment? The sales world will sell you anything. You know that. Yes, sir. They'll sell you anything. You know, you can get something to kill you. You can get anything you want. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes the government promotes it all. Yes. The only thing we're trying to sell you is good health. Well, it sounds good. I mean, it's been a good enjoyable. Good. Thank you so much, sir. Very important. Well, Emily, thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if any of you guys are in need of a primary care physician, um, or just, you know, maybe you want to further this conversation with Sandy, um, we're just so happy to have her as part of our Clearview family. And her clinic is down in Social Circle. And um, you can find her information on our website or her phone number there at the clinic is 770-267-8462. So it's just like the hospital phone number, but instead of a one, it's a two. 
at the end. So um, so we accept pretty much every insurance type, and we would love to have any of y'all join our, our patient panel if you're in need of a physician um, to take care of you. So thank y'all for coming. As always, just leave your stuff. No need to clean up. We'll clean up for you. And I hope to see you next month. We are going to be talking about vision next month. Cataracts. De macular degeneration, all sorts of things. So we're going to be talking about vision next month, and we'd love to have you guys back again, as always. So thank y'all for coming. Have a great day. <laughs>